Our next speaker is Dr. Charles Burton, and he will talk to us about China's global agenda, the Uyghur genocide as an evident step towards neo-fascist domination. Dr. Burton is a senior fellow at McDonnell Burry Institute, the Center for Advancing Canada's Interests Abroad, and a non-resident senior fellow at the European Value Center for Security Policy. He has published extensively on Chinese and North Korean affairs and Canada-China relations, and he has been commissioned to write reports on Canada-China relations for agencies of the Canadian government. Dr. Burton is a frequent commentator on Chinese affairs in newspapers, radios, and TV. in the People's Republic of China is worse than it has ever been. And this 
unfortunately is associated with the failure of the political program of the Chinese Communist Party. So the party under Chairman Mao Zedong came to power in October 1949, imbued with lofty ambitions for China to lead the world revolutionary transformation to Marxist utopian communism. And the Chinese Communist Party's constitution still, no, still avers today the realization of communism is the highest ideal and ultimate goal of the party. When I was a young man living in Shanghai, uh, one of my teachers told me that he expected, he had expected China to achieve communism and perfect harmony and prosperity by 1956, when he was a young person too. The enthusiasm for the ideological promise of a prosperous society based on equal distribution of wealth through public ownership and harmonious uh, society of the new socialist man, you know, captured the imaginations of Chinese people after decades in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century of destructive warlord chaos, Japanese invasion, and civil war. But by the 1960s, the promised paradise was mired in economic stagnation from failed industrial policies and the disaster of a famine engendered by the reorganization of the countryside into people's communes that led to the loss of some 40 million souls to starvation due to government um, bad policy. So, but um, that slide uh, says uh, the great, the glorious, the correct Communist Party uh, about 10,000 years, so long live the great, glorious, and correct Communist Party. Um, so the Communist Party cannot attribute the failures of their regime to defects in the ideology or political implementation. The only possible cause for failures in the great, glorious, and correct Communist Party's program has to be the pernicious influence of anti-socialist, revisionist, bourgeois, or feudal elements. Um, and, you know, and once these were cleansed from the body politic, cleaning the grit from the socialist machine, revolutionary progress could continue its historically inevitable surge. And so to that end, the great proletarian cultural revolution campaign was launched in 1966, which represents the disastrous culmination of political application of Mao Zedong thought. And the cultural revolution was designed to turn great disorder under heaven into great order under heaven and pave the way for transition from socialism to communism as the end of history. But in the Uyghur regions, this led to mass destruction of feudal antiquities by burning books and destroying mosques and other religious institutions, persecution and imprisonment of Uyghur intellectuals and spiritual leaders, and requiring Uyghurs to abandon Islam for relentless sessions of political study of Chairman Mao's works. And much of this destruction was carried out by Red Guards, and in uh, the Uyghur regions, these were Red Guards of Uyghur ethnicity, as you can see from the Red Guard uh, um, show, you know, armband that says uh, Red Guard in Chairman Mao's calligraphy, and then above is the identification of where that band of Red Guards came from. Um, these are uh, deluded youth, now in old age, filled with remorse for what they were made to do with the instigation of the false doctrine of Mao's Chinese Communist Party. You know, my most of my um, Roommates, when I was at university in China, also were active in the Red Guard movement, destroying books, uh, smashing uh, religious artifacts, and so on. But this did not get the Uyghurs or Chinese people closer to communist utopian harmony and plenty for all, but instead harsh economic reverses and mass discontent. After the death of Mao Zedong in 1976, China's Communist Party officially repudiated Mao's great proletarian cultural revolution political campaign as 10 years of disaster. But um, 
this led the regime to abandon the Marxist ideological basis for its political legitimacy, but it is now filling it with a vapid doctrine of Xi Jinping thought for socialism in the new era, which has no ideals beyond the affirmation of Xi Jinping's position as a dictator. And so you have these kinds of uh, ideological <coughs> training, and they have the two establishes and the two safeguards to establish the status of Comrade Xi Jinping as the core of the party central committee and of the whole party, and to establish the guiding role of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for the new era, plus safeguard the core status of General Secretary Xi Jinping within the Chinese Communist Party, and safeguard the centralized authority of the party, and Xi Jinping's megalomaniac program for global domination, dubbed the community of the common destiny of mankind, promoted by the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So this is really about the Cold War that Mr. Janice referred to. This uh, Belt and Road Initiative um, anticipates that China will achieve universal prosperity by 2035 and then redress the humiliation of China's humiliation by Japan and the Western powers in the um, period after the Opium War in 1840 up until the uh, 1950 or so. Through the, by, 19, by 2050 they plan to, to redress this humiliation through the realization of the China-led community of the common destiny of mankind. And Xi Jinping puts forward that China's rise will be in sync with the fall of US global hegemony, the liberal values informing the current multilateral global institutions such as the UN, the WTO, and NATO that buttress US global domination will follow the US into eclipse as the new world order informed by Chinese civilizational values makes a comprehensive rise to unassailable transnational power. And commensurate with this, the global economy is to be structured through the Belt and Road in, in Infrastructure Program, which consists of development of a massive worldwide network of Chinese built roads, railways, and ports worldwide. But all the belts and roads terminate in China to make China the center of global um, economic activity. So Xi Jinping's vision is that all nations of the world should be subordinate to China, both politically and economically. Uh, it fits with traditional values of all under heaven for the Chinese emperor. But as you can see from the map, the Silk Road economic belt passes through the Uyghur lands. So Xi Jinping's ideology demands that in due time there will be a new global coast prosperity sphere which will redress the historical humiliations of China by the liberal West and Japan and a new ex harmonious world order centered on China Han civilizational culture and subject to the great glorious and correct wisdom of the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Mr. Xi. Um, within the territory of the People's Republic of China, referred to by Beijing as the sacred continent, there can be only one nationality, the Chinese nation, Zhonghua Minzu. Um, this calls for the assimilation of all peoples inside the territory of the People's Republic to be fully assimilated to Han Chinese cultural norms and to speak Mandarin Chinese universally. So with the realization of the lofty prospect of communism as the political raison d'etre for the Chinese Communist Party's rule of China now in abeyance, to sustain its political legitimacy, the Chinese Communist Party shifted the emphasis of its purpose to being less communist and more Chinese. Of course, the Chinese Communist Party's program of revolutionary transition, transformation to socialism was always at odds with the traditional structures of authority and religion of the so-called ethnic minorities living in the People's Republic of China. Tibetan and Uyghur traditional structures of authority 
and religious ideological belief were seen as futile impediments to implementing the universalizing norms of Marxist-Leninist ideology. Civilizational norms of non-hand religion and culture were vilified as retrograde superstition to be replaced by political campaigns to purge counter-revolutionaries, the study of Communist Party statements, and the works of Matadong and other vapid propaganda. Socialist cultural products in print form or movies and plays were strictly constrained by Marxist strict ideological norms to two forms only, either revolutionary romanticism, which glamorizes life under Chinese communist rule, or socialist realism, which depicts how horrendous life was for the proletariat before the Chinese Communist Party assumed power. Um, and of course, this eliminates all possibilities for Uyghur um, cultural products to be uh, used. So then we have this man, Chen Trenguo. Eventually, in the 1960s, Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, they implemented the mass destruction of the libraries and antiquities of non-Han peoples designed to eliminate all residual vestiges of the spiritual basis of rich and meaningful ethnic identity. Cultural leaders were purged or co-opted into political sinecures to be trotted out, bedecked in colorful cultural garb on state occasions, but political power rested in humorless Han colors like Mr. Uh, um, the civilizational culture of the Uyghur peoples was reduced to folkloric status as a simple happy people who loved to sing and dance in traditional costume. Uyghur religion and ancient philosophies were scorned as backward and irrational sophistry. China's developmental policies in Xinjiang, while raising living standards, have had the effect of feeding Uyghur nationalism, while the Chinese Communist Party believed the economic benefits and affirmative action programming directed at the Uyghurs would lead to them feeling gratitude to the Han <coughs> and spur a gradual rise in support for and identification with the Chinese Communist Party's national and international agenda. In fact, um, you know, the opposite has occurred. The intention was that Uyghurs would see the Chinese language and mainstream Han culture as the sole route to modern technological future. But all of this has instead very evidently engendered heightened resentment and fueled irredentism, especially among Uyghurs who seek to become masters of their own fates in an independent Uyghur state called East Turkestan. In response, the Chinese Communist Party has successively implemented more and more stringent policies to suppress Uyghur nationalism, including limiting access to worshiping in mosques. Mandarin is displacing Uyghur language in education at all levels. They've been encouraging the mixed marriage of Uyghur women with Han men, and programs to reallocate Uyghurs to work in factories um, in Chinese coastal areas far from their Uyghur homes. Um, if I could just conclude by talking a bit about the digital technologies employed to repress Uyghur religion and culture. The uh, CCP uses a variety of techniques to monitor the activities of religious believers. China's state security uh, ministry's ambition is to collect a staggering amount of personal data from ordinary citizens. Phone tracking devices are now everywhere. Devices known as Wi-Fi sniffers and IMSI catchers can glean information from phones in the vicinity of these devices, which allow the police to track a target's movements. It's a powerful tool to connect one's digital footprint, real life identity, and physical whereabouts. There are phone trackers that can identify what apps are installed on a phone. Uh, for example, a Uyghur to Chinese dictionary app on a phone 
would indicate the phone mostly, most likely belonged to someone who was part of the heavily surveyed and oppressed Wager ethnic minority. In some places, Wagers are required to install police spyware technology on their phones. This is probably designed to induce self-censorship and caution in interaction with Wagers who are courageously standing up to the PRC regime's repressive measures. The Chinese police are creating some of the largest DNA and iris scan databases in the world. They are gathering DNA samples from men because the Y chromosome is passed down with few mutations. When the police have the Y DNA profile of one man, they also have that of a few generations along the fraternal lines of the family. Moreover, they have the facial recognition technology, um, which uh, in China they're estimated to be 500 million surveillance cameras in use, with more and more of them with sophisticated data collection capabilities. These cameras are used to track the movements of religious believers and identify those who visit religious sites. The police strategically choose locations to maximize the amount of data their facial recognition cameras can collect. There is technology to distinguish Uyghurs and Tibetans from Han citizens, and the, and the authorities are building upon facial recognition technology to collect voice prints from the general public, making anonymous conversations impossible. So the police in China are starting to collect voice prints using sound recorders attached to the facial recognition cameras. These devices can record audio from at least a 300 foot radius around the cameras. Software then analyzes the voice prints and adds them to the facial recognition database. So they know who you are and who you're with and what you're talking about. It far exceeds what George Orwell could have conceived in his novel 1984. Finally, um, the CCP uses artificial intelligence to analyze the data it collects on Uyghurs and religious believers. It includes information about their religious beliefs and practices, their social media activity, and their travel history. The CCP uses this data to identify and detain those who it perceives as a threat and to curtail any religious activity taking place outside of a state-designated location for prayer. Informal prayer gatherings in homes and forms of worship not officially endorsed by the PRC State Administration for Religious Affairs are illegal in China, and religious leaders not approved by the state are subject to imprisonment. There can be no indoctrination of children into religious belief by Chinese law. So, you know, big data analysis is used to identify the patterns in the data it collects on waiters. This allows the CCP to identify, from their perspective, Uyghurs who may be at risk of uh, engaging in radicalization or violence. Uh, finally, as we know very well, there are these camps. The people who are sent to camps are mostly likely determined by digital surveillance profiling. They have not committed any crimes against the law because if they had, they would be sent to prisons. Um, they're not allowed to in practice Islam in the camps. The language of the camps is Mandarin Chinese, not the Turkic Uyghur language. And they are kept in the camps indefinitely until they're considered sufficiently assimilated into Han Chinese mainstream culture and they lose their, uh, you know, their, uh, Han, their Uyghur identity. Um, it looks quite nice. Uh, in camps from the pictures that we see, but there are credible allegations of torture and rape of Uyghur women in these facilities. The children of detainees are sent to Mandarin language orphanages designed to take the Uyghur out of the Uyghur. They are taught a history that falsely claims that Xinjiang has always been ruled by the Chinese emperor. Unconfirmed, unconfirmed reports show the Chinese Communist Party expects Full assimilation of all Uyghurs will take place in 45 years from 
2015. So they expect it to be to the end of, of any kind of waiter identity to be uh, completed by 2060. So Xi Jinping now refers to Chinese ethnicity instead of a Chinese nation of 56 constituent ethnic components. Xi's ideology is that China is a single nation with a single culture, a civilizational state. Um, submission to the Han as a master race is the true meaning of Xi Jinping's much purported doctrinal promise of a common destiny for all mankind. It is about the annihilation of rich cultural traditions and genocide of peoples trapped in the People's Republic of China. Nothing more and nothing less. Thank you for your attention.